Hey, Dustin. Dustin, you need to get on. The show is starting. Hey, Dustin. I, I am here. I am here. My camera. Um, oh, I, I, it's messed up. I don't know what's going on, um, but this is a last second disaster that has taken place. And I apologize. So I don't know. I, I'm just going to oh, have to go with this graphic now. Um, I'm going to put my, I've put my best, my, my best face forward uh, for this one. Uh, well, then you better leave the camera off. Yeah, it's off. Yeah. All right. So, okay, I'll start the show. All right. Go for it. Don't, hey, relax. You're in, you're in good hands. All right. <laughs> in good hands. All right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the sons of history. Welcome to our show. We have a very, very special guest today who looks a lot like my nephew, David, who lives in Chicago. He's an investment banker, ladies. So, you know, you know, he'd be a good, you know, well, anyway. All right. So I don't want to get too much into that, but uh, that's not, you are there, right? You can hear everything I'm saying. I can hear everything you're saying. I can even see you through Zoom. So we're good. Okay. All right. So tell us about, uh, you know, well, actually, you know what, before we get into the author, who is the author? Don't His get name nervous, is, what, man. Don't get nervous. I know that you're taking the lead while Johnny, Johnny Carson, your Johnny Carson is on the line. I, I, remember. Hey, look, Paul Schaefer, Paul Schaefer never started a show. Neither did uh, Ed McMahon because I know and it's tough. I get it. Yeah. Get it. So and, and I did this once before. Go to um, subscribe. That, Come on. You that, can do it. Go to that, subscribe. What was it? Oh, God. You know, what was the judge's name? The one who wrote that book about the uh, the words of the founding fathers. Forgot his name. Uh, Bo- Boonstra. Mark Boonstra. Boonstra. Mark Boonstra. Yeah. That was the last time I had to do this. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, but we are going to be talking to Hold on. Charlie Goodyear, who wrote first a book about things President. First, you. What's that? Wait, what's that? First things first. Subscribe to the show. I know that. I'm going to get to that part. I'm going to get to that part. All right. What I was going to say was we are interviewing a guy by the name, an author by the name of uh, Charlie Goodyear, who's written a book about President James Garfield, who was our twentieth president, second one to be assassinated, fourth one to die in office. And he had the second shortest tenure of any president. Shorter, just William Henry Harrison beat him. Anyway, uh, but before we do that, uh, we do uh, we do ask for you to subscribe for our uh, on our. uh, You know what? You do it. I I can't do this. I'll be honest with you, man. That was tough to watch. (laughs) (laughs) I can only imagine how it is just for people to listen to. But man, that was tough to (laughs) to watch unfold. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't yet, subscribe to our show. Uh, Get on if you're watching on YouTube. Please subscribe. Hit the bell so you can get alerts. Now this is the last episode of the season. Uh, Our next season, a sixth season, isn't going to start until sometime in September. Typically mid September. So. If you haven't watched all of our shows, all almost 200 episodes, of course, not all of them are on YouTube, but all of them are on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google, and it's like a, a bunch of other platforms, uh, pretty much any platform that you're listening to. So you can listen to all those. You can splurge over the summer. I mean, what what else are you going to do? You're not going to do anything. You're going to sit there and you're going to learn from us. Okay. So subscribe to our epi- or to our podcast. Leave a nice rating and review, preferably five stars. Unfortunately, they don't allow six stars, but leave a a five-star review if you don't mind. Leave a rating uh, and a review. I just said that. Now I see. Now I'm see, I'm coming across like you, like I don't even know what I'm doing here. You know why? All right. The camera's broken. All right. So okay. I'm going to move on. All right. All right. We'll we'll move on. Yeah. Now he, he he Charlie is here. Correct? Did he make it? Because. You know, I, after Alan Gaff was on our show, I, I think he set the bar so high that we just <laughs> no one's uh, no one wants to come on our show because it, it would be like being on the Ed Sullivan show after the Beatles uh, performed. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, you can't live up to the hype. Um, and that's that's very unfortunate. No, no. C- CW is going to be joining us. Guaranteed. Um on this Memorial Day week, huh? What do you think about that? When this episode comes out, it's going to be Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day to everyone. Um, I don't think you say Happy Memorial Day. I think it's a... Somber Memorial Day? Uh, I think you wish people a... You know, I don't know how you wish... Uh, it's not a Happy Memorial Day. It's, I know it's, it's not, but it's that's a tough one. How would you say that? 
I'm wishing you a, I don't know, let's just say a wonderful Memorial Day. Um, wonderful? Really? So we don't we don't want them. We that's don't, the you substitution? Know. What's that? That's the substitution that you're going for? Not I happy, but I wonderful. I can't, uh, this is, you know, I, I don't know, it's... It's like how do you, you don't hey but listen you don't sit and say happy Pearl Harbor Day or anything like that so or happy 911 how, what do you say about 911 what do you just say like it's memorial day why don't you go to hell you know something like that is that is that better no cuz uh maybe the people our soldiers took out i don't know oh like yeah the, yeah like the nazis communists all right listen okay it's memorial weekend and it's a time to reflect on the um, the soldiers, sailors, airmen who who died in the line of duty. So that's pretty much what we. Uh, that that's what Memorial. That's what Memorial Day really is. It's not about you know vacation or picnics or or anything like that. It's a day of remembrance. So that's right. There you go. Okay. So glad we almost cleared that up. All right. Well, man. Uh, last episode of the season. I'm excited for our guest. There was a couple of things I wanted to mention. Oh, by the way, your question about High Noon, we were, we were talking about that, and I interviewed Maria Cooper, the, the, the daughter of Gary Cooper. She said that yours and or our uh, assumption or um, our view of High Noon as far as like the Hollywood blacklist, the commun- you know, like the Red Scare thing, she said we're spot on with... Uh, our analysis of of the film. Oh, that that's cool. But you know, it's kind of ironic though that he would of all people, Gary Cooper would have been in that movie because my understanding was that he was a conservative and he was uh, patriotic. Yeah, he was an anti-communist. Um, yeah. Why didn't they put? Was it Hayden Sterl? Wait, who was that guy that was? He he played uh, uh, General Jack D. Ripper in um, that Peter Sellers movie, Doctor Strangelove. That guy was a communist. He was the he was the police captain in in the Godfather who got uh, shot with Siloso. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that guy was a communist or a communist. I think he was a communist. Definitely a communist sympathizer. Well, I think Doctor Strange Love is sort of uh, seemed like a relatively heavy pro communist. Anyways, I don't want to get into all that, but uh, we were right, and so that's got to feel good, ladies and gentlemen. Our guest. For this episode is C.W. Goodyear. He has earned his degree. He earned his degree in global affairs at Yale University in 2016. Then he moved to Washington, D.C. His first book project was a collaboration with former naval officer Chris Fussell uh, in the book One Mission, How Leaders Build a Team of Teams. His latest work is the biography of James A. Garfield, the 20th president of the United States, entitled... President Garfield from Radical to Unifier. It's a fantastic read. If you like biographies, I can't recommend this one enough. I wrote a review for it a few weeks back, and really, I I gave it a a glowing review because it absolutely deserved a glowing review. We're excited to have uh, CW on the line. Now, he says that we can call him Charlie. Uh, His friends call him Charlie, so we like to think that we're already fast friends with Charlie. Uh, And so without further ado, we bring Charlie on the show. Charlie, how are you doing, man? Doing very well. Very happy to be on. Where are you located, uh, Charlie? Let's see. I am talking to you guys from Alexandria, Virginia, actually, so just outside of D.C. Oh, Alexandria. Are you in the uh, Alexandria safe zone? (laughs) Uh, I, I sense so. I sense you're a Walking Dead fan. Uh, I, I am, and uh, I, I wouldn't say that you can call me Negan, but I'm very happy to be in the safe zone. Okay, uh, Charlie, uh, we're all Negan, so <laughs> a little bit on the inside. All righty, first question for you. All right, now you wrote a book about President James Garfield. Now he was uh, president for only 200 days. Um, about 80 of them were bedridden, uh, making him the second shortest tenured president, if that's the correct way to say it, uh, other than William Henry Harrison, who I think he was president for only 30 days. Um, there's really not much known about him. He's in the middle of 
I want to say between Ulysses S. Grant and Woodrow Wilson and a string of presidents who none of them were elected for a second term and finished. So, and his vice president became famous, the one who took over for him uh, because of the movie Die Hard with a Vengeance, 21 out of 42. <laughs> so why, why Garfield? Yeah, it's very generous of you to call Chester Arthur famous, by the way, but that's a that's a side note. Uh, yeah, I found Garfield, I discovered him as a subject quite accidentally. Uh, I think every historian and biographer always in one way, either directly or indirectly, uh, they're always writing about their own times in some way, shape or form. And so when I began this project about four or five years ago, I was interested in finding a period of American history where the conditions were if not exactly like the ones we're seeing today, politically, socially, economically in America, then at least it's comparable in, in, in the general trend of polarization and discord. Uh, so I found myself researching the Reconstruction era and the Gilded Age, so the post-Civil War and then the post-post-Civil War period. And in my studies and in D.C., it's easy to get lost in the Library of Congress, but I, I did get lost. Uh, I kept finding the same figure in the background of pretty much every major event in that swath of time. And he was somebody who everybody, regardless of party, regardless of faction of party, was saying vaguely nice things about, sometimes in a passive aggressive way, but still generally nice. And uh, that person was James Garfield. Now, uh, Whenever he was mentioned by other historians, it was typically in a very uh, abbreviated way. It was James Garfield, future president, would be assassinated. You know, uh, he would be shot three months into his term. He would die about two and two and a half months after that. Uh, but I dug deeper, and in doing so, I found I gradually pieced together what I found to be maybe the most impressive political rise to power, certainly of the 19th century in American history, and then maybe of all American history. Um, to quote the president before Garfield, Rutherford Hayes, uh, the tr and this is Hayes speaking of Garfield by the time of Garfield's nomination, so he's not even president yet. Uh, Hayes said, the truth is no man ever started so low who accomplished so much in all of our history, not uh, Benjamin Franklin or Abraham Lincoln even. And that's talking about James Garfield, who's this president who, as you say, very few Americans today even know was ever in the White House. But didn't he and uh, Lincoln both start off um, kind of, I mean, they weren't part of the uh, swamp as we call it today. Uh, they, they, didn't have, uh, they didn't have connections. And, and Garfield was the uh, last person to be, last president to be born in a uh, log cabin. So, I mean, what are the parallels between him and Lincoln in terms of they were nobodies? I mean, at least I don't think Lincoln started in a, in a famous family. No, no, he didn't. Um, the biographical uh, comparisons are pretty interesting with that log cabin story. They both had that by the time that they ran for the presidency. Uh, they were both also eventually, I think, very similar uh, politically. They were moderate Republicans. They were people who uh, personally had very strong beliefs on uh, racial equity and on the direction of political reform in America, but they were also very practical politicians. They were willing to disguise and work around their own vision for what the end goal politically of America should be with practical political concerns. Uh, and as a result, they both attracted quite a lot of flack from members of their own party and the public on these matters. Even though if you got into their heads, they were in perfect harmony with uh, at least ideologically the most extreme wing of their party. Uh, but the big comparison, unfortunately, uh, well, I'll mention one other. They both had very compelling, politically compelling blue collar jobs, which was very important to their election campaigns. Uh, Lincoln was the rail splitter. And Garfield, when he eventually ran for the presidency, he was known as, uh, you know, the canal boy. He had worked on the Ohio Canal for a summer growing up. Uh, not that you'd known it'd only be a summer, because the amount of political imagery that came out of this, you'd think he was on it for years, but he did it only for a couple of months. Um, but the saddest comparison, of course, is that they were both assassinated. 
Uh, they were they were both assassinated in office, and the repercussions of those assassinations were massive for the country in very distinct ways. You know, there's a another comparison um, that I that I noticed, and it's the at the beginning of all of your chapters, uh, you quote uh, from Garfield's diary, uh, his his quotes from Shakespeare. Now, I've I've heard constantly that Abraham Lincoln was heavily inspired by the Bible and by William Shakespeare. Um, so, how did Shakespeare and Christianity influence uh, Garfield? Mm, that's that's a very good question. Uh, his political career began in big part because of his religious one. James Garfield was uh, an evangelical preacher in his mid twenties. And he was also juggling a variety of other jobs in rural Ohio, which was, you know, where he was originally from. And by virtue of being an excellent preacher, as well as a very respected schoolmaster in his community, in the Western reserve of Ohio, and it ended up being very important to his ability to uh, rally his community behind him uh, politically. Uh, and uh, specifically he was a disciple of Christ, which, uh, puts him in a ca in uh, a camp of three presidents who were disciples of Christ: uh, he, James Garfield, uh, Ronald Reagan, and Lyndon Johnson. Were all from this the, this this sect of Christianity. Uh, but it but so that was that was a very important role that religion played in particular in that case. And whenever he was up for big elections down the road in his political career. Uh, he could always count on the evangelical vote. That was a big reason why he won the presidency, actually. As for um, Shakespeare, uh, Garfield was maybe the most intellectual man, I think, to ever be president. Uh, he, was, he, he was not only this incredibly literary you know, man, he, he wrote regularly for the Atlantic and for the North American Review, but also he uh, was a practicing Supreme Court attorney while serving in Congress between 1863 and 1880. So imagine today that you had, uh, you know, one of our members of Congress, they're not allowed actually today, I believe, but uh, who was, you know, representing private cases in the highest court of the land while also being a major legislator of their times because Garfield became a very important political figure. Uh, that's just very impressive. And then after also the Supreme Court uh, career, he also in his free time, he wrote uh, an original proof of the Pythagorean theorem. And th this, this is a man, again, who started, he was raised by a single mother in a log cabin in rural Ohio. He, he just had an incredible intellect. And as you point out, um, throughout his diary in 1878, when I was studying it, he opened every day with a new Shakespeare quote. Uh, and uh, one of the easiest editorial decisions I had to make was, okay, I'm going to use these <laughs> to, to highlight different periods of his life and also kind of the themes that is, that is happening in that time. Because his life, it's 50 years. It's basically 1831 to 1881. And uh, he had one of the most long-lived political careers on the national stage of anybody in that period. So he ended up being, by virtue of his mind, his personality, since he was so friendly with so many different political uh, figures, and his writing. He was an excellent writer. Uh, he, he was such a marvelous witness to his times, his times that, again, seem so relevant to our own today. Except we don't have any uh, statesmen like him. <laughs> I, I don't think it's possible, really. I, 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 I maybe it, I'm very jealous of Renaissance men because they lived in times where it was the, the bar was lower to be excellent in different fields. <laughs> but uh, you know, we live in an era of specialization now. But if anybody could do it, he could. He also there's another famous anecdote of him writing Latin and Greek simultaneously in each hand. So left page Latin, right page Greek. So. Uh, Wonderful mind. Oh yeah. Well, uh, I wonder how he would do on TikTok. So <laughs> there, there's that. There's that. TikTok. What? Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I don't think he has that kind of charisma. But it's interesting because he wrote a piece for the Atlantic, right as the middle of the first disputed presidential election in American history was happening, where half the country was saying it was fraudulent. He wrote a piece for the Atlantic marking a hundred years of American history, 1776 to 1876. 
And he wrote of the invention of the telegraph. And he wrote specifically of not being sure if technology was going to be better or worse for statesmanship in America in the long term. And uh, your point of TikTok, throw away as it might have been, does make me, does raise bigger questions of, you know, is social media and politicians having to turn to social media, is that good for lawmaking? Is that good for getting the country on track? And yeah, the jury's out. Yeah. Hmm. Well, okay. Now, before I go to my next question, I did want to point out because I know someone is going to say something. Grover Cleveland doesn't count because he wasn't. Uh, elected consecutively. So before someone says anything, yes, he did serve two two full terms. Uh, you can blame Benjamin Harrison on that one, who, by the way, I think was what the grandson of William Henry Harrison, who had the shorter term. Alrighty, now after the Battle of Middle Creek, now we're we're in the Civil War period, and he's uh, he's in the Union Army. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know what uh, what rank he was, but I think he became a brigadier general after the uh, the Middle Creek battle. Um, but he was very lenient towards the Confederate soldiers of Kentucky and offered them amnesty. If you, if you come back, but you got to live in peace, you got to be loyal to the union, don't cause any troubles. And everyone at the time thought that that was pretty, um, I don't know if radical, but, but pretty lenient. So now, you know, and then there were other things where I read that uh, he didn't seem so lenient towards the rest of the Confederacy. He was a member of the Radical Republicans, so I know the Radical Republicans were pretty harsh, and I think he wanted to execute and exile some of the Confederate leaders. Um, so it looks like he, you know, not just that one, but I also noticed that in some cases he wanted to expand executive authority, and other times he was afraid. I think when Johnson was president, he was afraid of Johnson stretching executive authority too much. Yeah, he was. He, he was a, yeah, it, it, his political course, because it was so long, it was from 1863 to 1880 that he was in Congress again, and, or technically 1881, because that's when he, you know, became president. Um, but it's, it, it's such a long period in which he evolved so much. A, a lot of historians have struggled to place him on the ideological spectrum of Republicans. Uh, he, in the middle of the Civil War, and actually he joined uh, the Union Army in big part because he was a radical. He did want to be part of the liberation of Southern slaves, and he wanted to punish uh, Southern secessionists. Uh, he had this uh, He had this great quote, and this was at the beginning of the war, uh, he's already a state senator in Ohio. He's also still the president of a college, and he's also still a preacher. So this man did not really believe in downtime. But he's writing in the middle of the secession winter. May it not be an economy of bloodshed to tell the South that disunion seals the doom of slavery, that if the South forms a government actually based on the monstrous injustice of human slavery, it will be a cane among the nations of the earth. So he did have this fire and blood radicalism in him. But you're right that after Middle Creek, he 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 pursues amnesty with local rebels. This this conciliatory nature that had been in him since childhood, over the course of the Civil War and then afterward, and as it stretches on into the Gilded Age, you see him kind of rediscover his inner self of just kind of wanting all Americans to get along. Uh, he was a radical Republican, absolutely, and when he joined Congress halfway through the war. And he was actually the youngest brigadier general in the Union Army. So that's another feather in his cap. Um, he was uh, he, he wanted to not only, you know, immediately abolish slavery and institute full equality between the races, something that Lincoln was very hesitant about. Um, but he also wanted to redistribute southern plantation land to the formerly enslaved and to what he called loyal whites. And then you fast forward through the Johnson administration and then through Grant and then into Hayes. And all of a sudden you get a very different figure. He's the last standing radical, really. He, he, he had entered as the youngest congressman in America. And by the end of Reconstruction, he's actually one of the most experienced still left. And he's now minority leader. And he is rep, he's, his reputation is one for softness, for weakness, for conciliation with political foes. Um, and he still believed in the long run that America would end up in this more righteous 
place socially and in terms of uh, equity between all different types of Americans. But he had succumbed to the politics of pragmatism. And that's what makes him very compelling, I think, is that so, th there was never anybody who had such a clear, crystal clear vision for the ideal version of America. But he was also willing and very ready to subordinate that towards politics and pragmatism. So he had this, he had this, this uh, some would say weak, others would say good nature to uh, soften as, uh, you know, a, as the policies of reconstructing the South and uh, cr cleaning government failed. Uh, so he's interesting. He had, he had also a very good quote during the Johnson administration when the radicals, which he had then left, were trying to impeach Johnson because he was on the front row of that too. Um, he wrote, I'm trying to be a radical and not a fool. Two very hard things to reconcile. Uh, so that, that kind of shows you where he was in the end. Um, and of course, the way he got the presidency is by healing the wounds in the Republican Party, which ended up getting him killed in the long run. You know, speaking of the political conciliation, um, this takes place in the election before his, the 1876 election. Um, what was his role? Because he is sort of placed right in the middle of trying to um, create a solution or a resolution uh, for what many at that time and even even today, a lot of people would call an absolute political disaster. So what was his role in that? A political disaster is right. Just as a bit of background for listeners, the election of 1876 was the first election in American history where at, at least half of the country thought its, its process and outcome was fraudulent. And the background was that leading up to the election, uh, Democrats in the South had violently repressed the black vote. And when it came time for election day, uh, the results were that the Republican candidate lost the popular vote decisively. But as all of the pieces fell to the floor, uh, the Republican candidate Rutherford Hayes ended up winning the Electoral College per the official results by one vote. So one electoral college vote versus losing the popular vote decisively. And in the aftermath of those results, uh, you had Republicans basically use their control of the election machinery in parts of the South to then retroactively switch the disputed states over into the Republican column. So you had this terribly complicated situation. And when the country woke up after election day, uh, there were already threats of civil war and uh, a lot of rhetoric about the possible dissolution of the country again. So these are all themes that are sadly very familiar to modern listeners. Garfield was, by that point, the senior most Republican representative left in the House. The Democrats controlled the House, the Republicans controlled the Senate, and the whole country was basically in the aftermath of the election. We, they had the official results who had yet to be certified by Congress. And so there was this eyeing around of basically, would Congress certify the results? Would the Democrats interfere with the, uh, the, the congressional certification of the election? And there was a lot of uncertainty about which man would be inaugurated come inauguration day, 1877. Garfield was, by his virtue of experience and his connections, he ended up playing the most direct role of any individual in brokering the settlement of this election. He went down to Louisiana, which was one of the disputed states, and he, he, he uh, researched reports of democratic election, uh, violence against black Americans personally. He then came back to Washington and he was the minority leader in a democratic controlled house. The Democrat majority was saying the election was stolen, you know, uh, civil war again, yada, yada, yada. So Garfield had to be the Republican who was facing, poor man, facing down all of this rhetoric basically by himself. And then as he was trying to, you know, uh, br broker things and prevent, you know, an unsatisfactory outcome, he is privately approached by a cabal, I'd say, of Republicans and Democrats who are trying to come up with some kind of private deal in which a Republican, Rutherford Hayes, would take the presidency 
And in exchange, he would withdraw what was left of reconstruction policies in the South. So, and that ended up being the infamous uh, Compromise of 1877. And there's a lot of debate about whether that was a substantial agreement or not. But Garfield was on the front lines of every single part of this incredibly contentious and honestly very timely period of American history. Uh, and he, he's a big reason why things didn't go sideways in many ways. And he was also uh, part of the official machinery, the Electoral Commission, which decided how the Electoral College votes were finally allocated. Uh, so, again, talk about a wonderful witness to history. So I wanted to, to mention, I found in your book, there were times I would, I would laugh um, because he was so... Um, he was so concerned about his per the perception of the public, um, his public perception on anything politically related. He didn't want it. He didn't want to come across politically motivated. That's what it seems. He didn't want to seem like he was ambitious. Um, and we, I, I, I noticed this in his move from being in the military during the Civil War and having that opening to get into the House of Representatives. But he was really concerned about getting into that. And so going back and forth, um, he was concerned about how his constituents would view him. Um, and then we move into this intriguing story of his nomination, which I did remember laughing about. He was so <laughs> concerned. And he wasn't, correct me if I'm wrong, like, from from what I was reading, it seemed like he had absolutely no intention to become the the candidate for the Republican Party. And he seemed to, he, like I said, he seemed to always want to seem like he was free of ambition. How did he uh, touch on touch on that idea, but also how did he become nominated uh, for the president for the candidate of the Republican Party? Yes, that his the way ambition tore him apart inside and made him this great contradiction. It's such a deep topic when it comes to him. And I'd start off by saying, like a lot of great politicians of all times, he liked to say that he was a bad one and he liked to appear to be a bad one. And so throughout his life, from the very first political office he got, which was a state senatorship, he was pathologically obsessed with appearing in public like he didn't want it. That was a very big part of American political tradition of that time, but there's also something uniquely personal about it with him. He was much more uh, pathological, uh, neurotic about it than any other politician of his time. And he would, as you mentioned, publicly, he would try very hard to rally his friends and to present this face of somebody who was being unwillingly just thrown up to the precipice of American political power. Privately, he badly wanted a lot of these roles. He wanted to be a state senator. He wanted to be, you know, the youngest man in Congress. He he, he badly wanted to be chair of all these powerful congressional committees. Um, but he was, for a lot of reasons, he wanted to think, I think, he wanted to pretend to think like he didn't actually do anything to receive them, even though in truth he did. But also he was very, he was terribly self-conscious about how the public perceived him. You're entirely right. But there's also a very important point when it comes to the presidency, because his, his political career was so long uh, that he saw a bunch of very good friends of his in Washington decide they wanted to run for the presidency and it ended up kind of ruining them he he saw this happen so often with his friends and mentors like treasury secretary sam and chase uh james blaine is another very good example they would be they would they would realize these great american statesmen that they could be president one day and that they would then shift their behavior into making a run for the white house possible and likely for them and by doing so in Garfield's mind, these people were actually killing what made them great statesmen in the first place. And that would, and it would lead to their downfall. And so that happened so often to his friends, he called it the presidential fever. And he wrote about it as being one of the most malicious and deadly illnesses in Washington. And I think that might still be true today. But what makes that so he was genuinely afraid of developing that he said he would never in his life succumb to the presidential fever himself. And then he ends up in a position by 1880, where he is the man the Republican Party is turning to, 
to save them from these awful candidates who were running in 1880 from different factions of the party. You had Ulysses Grant, who was running for a third term. Everybody said, you know, Kaiser Grant, Emperor Grant is coming to, you know, ruin uh, the American democracy and become this tyrant by getting a third term in the White House. You had James Blaine, the magnetic man, who was so famously self-centered and pompous that no one could bear to have him be the Republican nominee, even though his fans were so devoted to him. And then you had all these independents who were long shots and, for lack of a better term, bookworms who had no real chance at getting the nomination. And so people started coming to Garfield as the minority leader in the House, as this kind of universally appealing milk toast candidate who everybody vaguely liked. And he was very scared. He, 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 he did not want to be nominated ahead of the convention. And so what happens in the convention, and I'll keep this very long, as you know, it's an entire chapter of the book, but I'll keep it short. He ends up being on the floor as the as the floor manager for another candidate. And a series of events happen during the the during the, the convention, the Republican nominating convention of 1880, where Garfield is kind of accidentally catapulted onto the stage. And he happens to whether by design or by pure accident in some in all these cases it's kind of a mix he happens he has the misfortune of saying the right thing at the right time to make himself the nominee and so when the voting begins after 30 ballots basically the convention is deadlocked no republican candidate can get the majority of the votes and people start throwing votes to garfield and he goes pale in his seat and he 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 he, he blanches as for whether he wanted the presidency, I think it is incredibly ambiguous. And it, it's it's not a binary answer. Uh, it's actually more, it, he's somewhere along a spectrum. There was part of him, because he had this volcanic ambition. Uh, there was part of him that did want it, but there was also part of him that was terrified, terrified of being in this role. Because his career, he had seen so many presidents fail. He had seen so many promising people go into the White House and end up leaving it miserable and without many of their policy agendas accomplished and he'd been helpful and then harmful to a lot of those administrations and he had no you know he was very afraid of actually being in that spot himself despite a big part of him wanting it because because all politicians want it in america they all want the white house and then when he wins the presidency he has this i mean i might be skipping ahead we can go back if you'd like but he has this nightmare after winning he has this nightmare uh, before actually taking his oath of office of being caught in a storm on a canal boat with his running mate, Chester Arthur. And the canal boat, which is, of course, a symbol of his own past, takes on water and starts to go down. And he swims to the shore and he turns around and he sees Chester Arthur drowning. And then he doesn't go in to save Chester Arthur. And then he runs off into the storm. And it's just it's just from a historical and writing perspective it's just fascinating. And then, of course, all of this premonition he had, all of this fear of the office, it was well-placed. He is killed. He's killed in office. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's just a, there's so much that his life tells us, I think, about the nature of politics in general and of history, of course, but of also just political animals and how they think and their contradictions. And, uh Poets couldn't write it better, just how his life went and how he viewed the office, which ended up being his doom, despite his best intentions. You know, it's funny you say that because um, I, I was sitting thinking about it and, you know, um, you know, history will say Andrew Jackson had a pretty successful president. But between Andrew Jackson and him, I want to say maybe Polk was the only one that was successful and uh, didn't die in office because I think there were th three people died in office before him. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I can kind of see why he was a little hesitant in um, in wanting to be president at that point because, yeah, I don't think... Because there were, there were just every president um, before him, uh, like I said, going back to J to uh, Andrew Jackson and not counting Polk, mm. uh, not, not too... Uh, didn't go over too well. No, not at all. Yeah, didn't he? Uh... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say Lincoln assassinated Johnson. You know, uh, impeached and barely escaped being removed from office. Uh, you had Grant, who left office in a storm of scandal and leaving behind the perceptions of a corrupt 
American federal government. And then Hayes, uh, who by virtue of the nature of his election, which we've already talked about, was talked of as rather fraud or his fraudulency, and then ended up leaving after one term. And he was very happy to escape from one term. And Garfield had been legislating in all of those administrations. So he was he was like, why would I, well, why, that they're in, you know, uh, they're in only lies doom, that path to the executive mansion. But sorry, I, I, I cut off your question. No, 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 no. Um, didn't he run, ag- he ran against um, Winfield Scott Hancock, correct? He did. Okay. Yeah, he did. You know, interesting, yeah. um, a lot of people, um, well, I, I, I don't know if, if people know this, I was going to throw this in. Um, he was, uh, he was in the thick of uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. He was, uh, during Pickett's charge, um, his opponent was, uh, I think his name was Armitage, and they were like best buddies. Um, Hancock, Hancock was fighting for the Union. He was in the, um, where the, the high water mark took place the, uh, at the cemetery. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah, Hancock. And uh, right on the other side... Against him was his good friend. Um, I think his name was Armitage. I hope I'm not butchering his name. And when uh, and both of them both of them got hit during that battle. And when Armitage found out, he cried. But uh, Hancock survived. Armitage didn't. But yeah, that was the pick. That was Pickett's charge on day three of uh, of Gettysburg. That's. Uh, I mean, that's that encapsulates the uh, just the bizarre nature of that conflict in so many ways. That they were best friends. You know, West Point comrades just right alongside each other, and the, and right. you know, and the fact that Hancock ran as a Democrat, but you know, he was fighting for the North, and the Democrats, the Southerners, were known to be the Democrats. So that was kind of ironic there too. Yeah, the the Northern Democrats were in some ways back then even more firebrand than the, some of the Southern Democrats. <laughs> there there are a lot of cases of the Northerners going too far. Uh, th- that that wing of the party going too far in a few political battles, including the first federal shutdown, which is interesting, which happened in 1879. Not a shutdown as we moderate we currently understand it, but it was kind of it was the similar similar budgetary fights. Hancock was uh, Winfield Scott Hancock was not a very good presidential candidate to Garfield's eventual misfortune, but uh, uh, yeah, he was. Um, the Democrats by that point were getting very desperate. They they had lost, you know, every single presidential election since uh, the Civil War. So they kept on iterating. It's interesting to see how they evolved their model of candidate. Uh, Samuel Tilden, who they had in 1876, he was good. He was a unionist in the Civil War and he had, you know, been a reformer. But he was still a little he, he was still a little bit too 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 friendly with the old rebels for for to win in the general. And so um Hancock, the Democrats were like, surely we've got it now, and didn't work out. Sadly, um, they would they would need to wait for your friend, um, you know, Cleveland to break to to break the tie there. Well, okay. So my my question for you is that um, other than the Pan American summit that he had planned, and I believe it it went to hell after his assassination. Um, what what would Garfield have accomplished? Um, had he not been shot and, and assassinated? That's a very good question because many people read his inaugural address and they see the things that he's promising, universal education. If you read it a certain way, you're thinking he's going to return to enforcement of the the, the uh, Reconstruction Amendments in the South and, and civil service reform. Uh, I think he would have been a disappointing president, probably. This this is all conditionalized, of course, but so much of the way people remember him is colored by this version of him that American society created after his assassination. They they venerated him. They made him this great martyr for uh, you know a, a lost ideal that never really existed. Uh, his uh, and this is the perception of the time as well. I should say. Uh, the, people said that uh, for the reform cause, for civil service reform, for professionalizing the American bureaucracy, uh, Garfield dead was way more useful to that cause than Garfield alive. I think he would have been, uh, I think he would have been essentially moderately progressive towards the goals that he established in his inaugural address. He would have made some unconventional moves, but not drastic ones in the direction of things like 
racial equity, like civil service reform, and like public education. Because uh, that's kind of this, that was the style of his politics towards the end of his career. And you could see him make moves towards that. Uh, he, for on the topic of uh, racial rights, he made quite a big deal of trying to appoint Black Americans to positions of federal power. That was something that had, that Hayes had done as well. But Garfield did it in a more dramatic way. And he the, the, his appointees included Frederick Douglass and Bruce Blanche, who was the first uh, Black senator um, elected from the South. So you, you saw him being very creative in how he was trying to use executive power. And then he would have done some token civil service reform uh, moves. He would have limited tenure by a fixed amount in the federal bureaucracy. And uh, especially after he defeated the, the, the boss, the corrupt boss wing of the Republican Party, you would have seen that happen. As for the Pan-American, uh, the, the foreign policy accomplishments you mentioned, I've got to lay that more at the feet of James Blaine. I think Blaine was actually the architect behind those foreign policy breakthroughs. And by serving in that role, Blaine in the Garfield administration, then the Arthur administration, Blaine actually ended up laying the foundation for America's uh, international expansion. The, uh, the, the, the quote unquote American empire that emerged during the McKinley and Roosevelt administrations. Uh, you know, the move through Hawaii and then the Spanish-American War and all of the plunder that America had after that. That was all based off of this outward looking version of American foreign policy that Blaine innovated. And you might say that that's not surprising because Blaine was a very acquisitive person. He liked power quite a lot. And you could see how he would apply that on a national scale. And he did. Uh, and one of Garfield's smartest, smartest moves was making Blaine his secretary of state. So speaking of uh, sort of moving on from Garfield, uh, after the assassination, you have Chester Arthur obviously taking over as president. How did the assassination and the assassin's statement of, I am a stalwart and I want Arthur for president, uh, how did that change the political mindset of Arthur? Um, and how did Garfield's death affect reform. Yes. So the stalwarts, when the assassin shouted, I am a stalwart, it's worth noting that the stalwarts were a wing of the Republican Party who were ideologically devoted to the policies of Ulysses Grant. But specifically, they were fixated on this idea of the spoils system. The stalwarts operated under the belief that political power, a, a critical part of political power is the right to abuse it and to personally profit and monetize the offices of the US government. So in that era, it started before Grant, but Grant is historically where it's perceived as really taken off. When you would have uh, senators and congressmen win office, they had the right to dictate the appointment of federal jobs in their jurisdiction. And that included tax collectors, it included sheriffs, it included post office workers. Uh, pretty much most of the public apparatus was up to congressmen to control in their little fief. And so the stalwarts were pioneers of uh, the boss system, where they would take this appointment power and they would monetize it and they would use it to basically form rings, which are also known as machines. And so this was common across government, but the stalwarts were very big practitioners of that. And there was no more infamous practitioner other than Roscoe Conkling than Chester Arthur. Chester Arthur had been appointed the customs house collector of the port of Manhattan, which for much of the Grant administration made him the most highly paid member of the federal government in, Amer in, in America, because he could, as part of his role controlling customs in New York, he could take a personal cut of the levies in, in, of, of the fines imposed on imported goods. And so when Garfield was uh, you know, nominated, the Republican Party was divided into a variety of factions, one of which was the Stowarts, and the Stowarts were very powerful. Garfield needed to buy their allegiance if he had any chance of winning the presidency. And so what he did, he did a few different things, but one of them was he made Chester Arthur his vice presidential candidate, because that was seen as this great uh, this, this great gift to the Stowart wing to buy their support for Garfield as the unity ticket. And there was this great line after the 
convention that this reform, so this clean government editor wrote, and it said, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but it said, you know, nominating Chester Arthur for the vice presidency, that might give us pause, but there's no reason to think anything will happen to Garfield. So we're fine, <laughs> which is, you know, in, in the entry for uh, 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 jinxing yourself, I think. But when Garfield was shot, it happened after this big falling out he had with the stalwart wing of his party. And by, by a virtue of that fallout, it inspired essentially a mentally ill man to identify with the stalwart wing of the party and then decide that if he shot Garfield, then Chester Arthur, a stalwart like him, would take the presidency and would be so grateful that uh, Arthur would award this crazy, this, this mentally ill man, you know, any post in his control. So when this happened and when Garfield hung on for a little while, uh, the country turned vastly against not only the Stowarts, but also the spoil system in general. His Garfield shooting became this rallying cry for clean government and for uh, a punishment of the worst practitioners of this old corrupt boss system. And it's a very interesting case, I think, of the American people punishing a political wing, not for what they exactly did, but for what their rhetoric inspired somebody to do in the American public. But as you as you hint at, Garfield's shooting ended up being the reason that the spoil system was ultimately done away with. Uh, in the aftermath of Garfield's shooting, Chester Arthur, who was objectively the least qualified man to ever be thrown into the presidency. He had never been elected to anything before the vice presidency. He had just been one of these appointees. He had this remarkable change of heart about uh, what he should do as president, as opposed to what he had done in his political career before. And you saw the most remarkable change in a person. And so he ended up passing legislation called the 1883 Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act, which basically started to do away with congressmen controlling political appointments and instead usher in a period of, which we still enjoy today, uh, professional federal uh, bureaucrats and a professional civil service system. So it, it's one of those moments in American history that are that seem minor, but it yields all of these intangible results for us today, these intangible benefits. Um, it's the reason why when you go through government service, you're not discriminated against based on your political ideology and you're not being seen through the lens of politics and that the person across the desk from you, be they, again, a law enforcement officer or an ambassador or a uh, you know post office worker, they're not a political appointee. They're just there to do the function of their their job. So it, it's, it's, a, it's another very interesting chapter of history that Garfield's life was very closely connected to. Now, you, when you're now, saying, I know that I, I know that Alan has the last question, but I, I wanted to bring this in. You said that you didn't think that Garfield would have had a very successful or good presidency. Um, do you think that he wound up accomplishing more dead than he would have alive? It's impossible to know for sure, but I would be very confident in saying that. I think yes, uh, his death catapulted the civil service reform movement forward by what people in that time said were decades. So he advanced in, and I'm not saying that his death was a good thing. This is not me saying, thank God he died, but I am saying, but by virtue of his death, there was a very major policy change um, that shifted the, the political tectonic plates uh, for, you know, centuries to come. We, we live in a different world because he died a more different world, I think, because he died than if he had lived. And uh, so th that would be my answer to that. Uh, yes. And again, that's not me saying that's not me celebrating this awful occasion. Before I get to my last question, um, you mentioned something about the bosses. Um, now, I know uh Boss, I, I want to. This is coming to mind. I haven't read about this in a while. Boss Tweed wasn't he from New York? He had Conklin from New York. He had Chester Arthur from New York. I mean, was that all like part of uh, same machine or? Uh... No, they were different machines. At least so. So Boss Boss Tweed was a Democrat. So he was part of the Democratic machine. He was part of Tammany Hall. Was was how that they were referred to, and. Um, so Conkling was 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 the Republican alternative to I don't want to say directly to Boss Tweed because they're uh, they're distinct 
animals and they worked in different ways. But Conkling was a Republican boss, but both ultimately were, uh, the reason both were very powerful machines for one party or the other was because New York was the continent center of commerce. It was, it was, a, it was uh, you know, incredibly densely populated. It was commercially incredibly rich. And because of that, the spoil system had particularly lucrative yields. Uh, for example, uh, in New York, uh, court immigrant court clerks were allowed to personally pocket fees collected from American immigrants. And if you can access the appointment power over the clerks, you as a political ring, be you Tammany Hall or the Stalwart, the Stalwart machine, you, know, you can tap a pretty big part of revenue. You start charging the clerks a little bit of money so that they can keep the, the you know their 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 own personal uh, uh cash machine rolling and you can build a very uh, you know tragically a very profitable enterprise for yourself as a politician and that's exactly what both democrats and republicans did at different periods in, in that decade uh so we, we we hear the term corruption i think thrown around a lot uh but the the the, the norms of that era that garfield witnessed and that he tried to confront and that his death ultimately helped solve really puts it in context, I think. So he was, uh, he was shot in uh, a train station, uh, sixth, sixth or seventh in constitution. Um, train station's gone. There's now the national gallery of art, which is one of the Smithsonian museums. Is there a marker? Uh, I, I read something about a star, but, that was when it was in the train station. Any marker saying this is where Garfield was? Uh... That's that, that, that's a great question. The star is gone. So in the original train station where Garfield was shot, there was this memorial, the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad. They did have a little marker, the star, showing where Garfield was uh, shot. When that train station was torn down, uh, the star went missing. No one knows where it is even to this day. And to this day, there is no marker on the national mall for where this president was you know ultimately assassinated uh there is movement to change that i will say senator chris murphy of connecticut is a big garfield fan uh in part because the senator went to williams and garfield went to williams college so there's this personal connection and so he so the senator murphy is trying to get something put there but there are other monuments to garfield around if you go to the capitol um, and you go to the southwest corner, you'll see a statue most people ignore. But at the center of a roundabout on the southwest corner of the U.S. Capitol, there is a giant statue of Garfield and that it's it's hard to get to because there are cars winging around it. But that's one symbol of him that still permeates or sorry, is still perpetuating to this day. There's also a statue of him in Statuary Hall in the Capitol building. He's one of Ohio's two statues that are allowed in Statuary Hall. And then across the country, there are an incredible amount of things named after him. Uh, I, whichever city you know you happen to be in, if you're a listener, uh, you know, just type in Garfield into Google Maps, and you're probably going to find either a hospital or a street or an avenue or a school near you named after this man. And it's because after his death, the country went into such a period of mourning that he became you know, larger than life, and. Um, that legacy, and I might end on this, is it, it stretches to weird places. The cat, the cartoon cat, that is named indirectly after him because the cartoonist's relative, I think his grandfather, was named after James Garfield. And then also Johnny Cash wrote a song about the assassination, which is interesting. Um, but it's it, it, all in all, it's a fascinating person who was, again, a remarkable witness to terribly relevant period of American history. And he manifests in the strangest ways, I think, and very interesting ones. Well, it's uh yeah, it is, it is fascinating, a fascinating figure. And, um, I was, I, I, I was blessed to, to get to read and really get into the, into the story. And I, I encourage people to, to purchase the book. I know it's coming out, I believe July 4th of this year. Um, it's called President Garfield from Radical to Unifier. Uh, Charlie, thanks so much for, for joining us, man. This has been a, a fantastic conversation. Uh, and 
like I said in in the review, it, it is a fantastic book, um, really just through and through. And I I don't always get to, unfortunately, I don't always get to say that in in book reviews. Um, but fantastic work, and thank you again for joining us. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you, guys. You know, I wish we were able to call him CW because then we could have called me AW. Oh man, yeah, that's you like brilliant. that or? No, not really. All right, so, but you know, but he did he not look like my nephew, my nephew David? I don't know. I've never seen your Dave. I've never seen your nephew. I'm. I, I thought I showed you a picture of him. You didn't. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah. So he looks like uh, my he looks like my nephew David. So there you go. But uh, really, you know, um, it's you don't think of President Garfield as someone that you uh, would write a book about. But you know, it was a it was a real fascinating time. Um, you know, he was actually he was shot about twelve days before Billy the Kid. So interesting. Yep. Yep. Pat Garrett shot Billy the Kid on July fourteenth of eighteen eighty one, and uh, President Garfield was shot on July the 2nd of 1881. So Garfield was a very fascinating man. He, he, was, a civil, he was a Civil War general. Um, and yeah, the guy was, was a brilliant man in terms, he, he could read and write Greek and Latin. He, you know, he studied the classics and he was a reformer and he was an abolitionist. I, I believe he was an abolitionist, but I think he would be kind of lumped in there. He was. Uh, but he, and, and, and in fact, I think at some point he was kind of unhappy with Lincoln because he, he didn't think Lincoln was trying to get rid of slavery fast enough. Right. I'm not, right, right. So, uh, but yeah, he's, you know, it's too bad that he, he uh, didn't get to fulfill his potential. No, yeah, that's, that's tough because, um, you, you know, and, and Charlie mentioned it, um, they had to say, or it was like President Garfield, right? Because they didn't want the cat to come up in, in the search engines, right? And so when you look at it, it's like, well, President Garfield, as you mentioned at the at the beginning of, of the questioning, he was only in office for 200 days. And most of those days, he wasn't in office, right? So it's like, what can you write about? And come to find out, there's he is he has such a fascinating story um, and his, his rise to political power and prominence. Uh, is is really fascinating, and I would say that he is the type of person that people should emulate. Um, just just looking into his into his life, but like you say, there are a number of presidents that aren't worth writing about as far as possibly really their presidency. But I do think if you become president of the United States at any point in time, your life is probably worth having a biography on. And I will tell you this. I I think I I think I've had it. Tell me how you feel. I think I've sort of had it with the Lincoln and FDR biographies. Can can we move on to other biographies? It seems like almost every year a new Lincoln or a new FDR biography is coming out. I I Enough yeah, I, I I have to agree with you on that one. I don't know why they keep I mean, what what do you, what do you, what groundbreaking material are you coming across? Exactly, exactly. And you know, if, um, you know, like I said, we, we interviewed someone who wrote about uh, Warren G. Harding. Um, so you have this book on um, James Garfield, and it, you know, you, you're going to stand out because if you want to do a research paper, it, do they still call them research papers nowadays? Sure, white um, paper. I, anyway, um, but if you're going to do a research paper or you want to find out about uh, James Garfield, you know, OK, you, you have this book. Yeah. And OK, now you have an, a, a pretty good source material. And, um, you know, but yeah, if you do another book about Lincoln or you do another book about FDR or throw Michelle Obama on the cover of yet another magazine, you know, <laughs> and you do a search... You know, it's you're going to be inundated, and the likelihood of of people picking your article or your book is going to be, you know, the the odds are going to be, you know, not so good. Yeah, they may be stacked against you, but I'm just saying it from a from a research perspective. I'm like, I wonder how many of these biographies are just pulling from you know previous biographies. 
I think this is the first biography, like full-fledged Garfield biography in the past 40, 50 years. So, yeah. How many how many Lincoln or FDR biographies have been written in the past 40 or 50 years? God knows how many. More probably enough to fill my freaking bookshelf. All right. Well, you know, if you do if you do a search, you will find a ton of Lincoln books that were written around, you know, his contemporaries. And and it, yeah, it, it didn't stop. So yeah, I mean, what what new material do you have? Yeah, so, and exactly, exactly. So well, anyways, I don't want to I don't want to drone on about that. All right, man. Well, that's that's it. I hope you enjoy. Well, I hope you don't enjoy your Memorial Day because you shouldn't, right? Isn't that the whole idea? You don't need to enjoy your Memorial Day. I I, I don't know. You know what? We maybe we need to ask like a gold star mother or a veteran or something. Um, or maybe we need to reach out to the, the witch of Endor and bring up the ghost, what? Of, the ghost of a fallen. Okay. Really? really? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just, you know, I, I want, I want people to remember that this is a day. This is a day of remembrance. Um, you know, I, I remember I was watching the 4th of July fireworks one time and i remember uh obama he tweeted uh en- enjoy the weekend or enjoy the fireworks or something like that now not, nothing mentioning about the sacrifices of our founding fathers and then i watched on tv where they did fireworks and and they were playing you know m- the music of today nothing of a patriotic nature and, and i was just sitting wondering does any is anyone going to remember what what the 4th of July is all about. And it's the same with Memorial Day. It's the same with Veterans Day. Um, I, I, I hope people will reflect, even Christmas, you know, Christmas is about the birth of Christ. Um, you know, I, I want, I hope people will, will remember Memorial Weekend for what it really is and not just another three-day holiday. Yeah, I think that's the problem with time. Uh, the further you get away from something, uh, the less you care about it. It's just the way it is, and it goes with everything. Um, yeah, but no, I, I agree with what I agree with what you're saying. Um, you got to remember certain things for for what they actually represent. All right, man. Well, it's great to talk to you. Um, I enjoyed the conversation with Charlie. This is the end of the season. Um, I wish you all the best. I will probably see you a couple of times, maybe in between this season and next season. Um, But till then, I bid you adieu. And ladies and gentlemen, we wish you the very best. And for all you kids out there, I hope you enjoy your summer. Don't go crazy. Nah, go crazy. Just don't do anything too stupid. All right, see you all later.